Well, good morning, Branch Church, and good morning to our Branch Church family online. It's a blessing to be with you and to hear the joy of your conversations and, and, and the fellowship of your heart. In high school, we did a really cool physics project where we brought items in, and we walked them to the top of the high school football stadium, and then we got to drop them off and watch them curse splat. How exciting for high school kids to be able to do something like that. Of all the items dropped, I think the most exciting one was a television. And I want to say it was an older television, too. The project did have a purpose, though. It had some kind of physics formula purpose. We were trying to figure out the speed and the force and the distance, and the, honestly, I don't even know what was going on. We were dropping stuff off a of bleacher. It was very exciting. <laughs> when things get dropped off a of bleacher that high, what do you think happens to the object? I'll tell you what happens. What happens is that object gets tested. Some things drop and immediately explode and shatter. Some things drop and get dented and maybe roll a couple feet. Other things like a bowling ball might go down, hit the ground, and stay right there and go nowhere. If your faith were to be dropped off the, the, the side of a high school football stadium, how would it fare? If your faith were to be locked in a dark room and not allowed to escape for a very long time, would it still shine? If your faith were to be squeezed by the enemy, what would come out? The book of Lamentations can be difficult to read. It's one thing to talk about darkness once, twice. It's another to do it over and over again and over again. And then, and then poetically, and then A to Z in the Hebrew alphabet where you feel like it's constantly just being shoved in your face. And you wonder, Sean, are we really going to read the whole book of Lamentations? And the answer is yes. Because if you can make it through their darkness, you will also see their light. And that light will carry you through your darkness in the most profound way that you could ever possibly imagine. Israel has been suffering profoundly, to say the least, in Lamentations chapters 1 and 2. And today as we dive into chapter 3, the poet is going to show them the way through and out of that actual darkness. He's going to speak about further what is good to actually do while you're still in it, and you're waiting upon the Lord in that time. Today as we read Lamentations chapter 3, we're going to learn the following, that God's character, God's character moves us to hope. God's character, who he is, moves us to hope for change and suffering and darkness. Who he is brings us to a place where we say that that suffering and darkness does not have the final word. God's character does. And that is the light that we will hold on to. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Lamentations, chapter three, begin, Lamentations beginning chapter three, verse one. Find Jeremiah, turn right, and you'll turn right into Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 3 is also a poem. Just like chapters 1 and 2, it is also an acrostic. That means it goes through the Hebrew alphabet from A to Z all the way through. It's very thorough. There's one minor difference, though, with chapter 3 versus the first two. Chapter 3 is a full acrostic. What does that mean? Well, chapters 1 and 2... Verse 1, verse 2, the very first word corresponded to that letter in the alphabet. Chapter 3, every line corresponds to the letter of the alphabet in which it is under. So it is even more full, even more true of an acrostic poem. It is amazing that someone was able to put this together, but really not when you think about how God inspires people to do things. As we go through the first 24 verses, I want you to notice the metaphors that are used. He's going to jump from one metaphor to the next. And we want to sit those, know those, put them all together, because then it is through those metaphors and out of them that the light will actually come and shine for Israel at this time. So let's pick up Lamentations chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. He says, I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me, he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. 
He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. In the first six verses, the poet suffers darkness. The first six verses are controlled by the metaphor of darkness. The city Jerusalem, she does not speak here. Zion does not speak. It is an individual within the city who is now describing their personal experience. And their personal experience is this. They have been driven into darkness by Yahweh himself. There's no light. There's affliction, but there's no light. There's wrath, but there's no light. There's God's hand against him every single day, over and over again in which he feels, but there is no light. The speaker is like a rotting dead man in a grave, except he's not in a grave and he's not actually rotting. Verse seven. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy. Though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked. The speaker now suffers as a prisoner. And as a prisoner, he has been walled in. He has been separated from the ability to actually escape his situation. There's no way out. And not only that, there's chains that are weighing him down. No answers to prayer. No, no way out. I like how Dwayne Garrett says, he says, God has purposefully shut him in. No cry for help. No prayer. No way of escape exists for this person. Verse 10. He is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He turned aside my steps and tore me to pieces. He has made me desolate or a picture of being deserted. The poet now suffers and a new metaphor as prey. God is pictured as a ferocious beast awaiting for him. What animal would you never want to run into in the outdoors? A bear. I heard anything. I'm with you. I don't want to see anything. I don't want to see a skunk. Maybe, maybe a bunny rabbit from a distance. We have coyotes where we live. And like 6, 6.30 in the morning, I go out for a jog. And I run down the street. I'm all happy. I'm going to get it in. And there's a coyote in the middle of the street. Stops and locks eyes with me. My heart drops to the core of the earth. Thank God he skittish and took off. So I won the, I won the stare down. We'll just make sure everyone knows that. No, if he had come at me, I would have ran. I don't know what I would have done. I usually look for the nearest truck, something to jump onto. But can you imagine running into a mountain lion, a bear, an actual lion? That's how the speaker feels. Even if I do escape, God is going to meet me like a lion or a bear. These are pictures of judgment. These are pictures of what God does to the enemies and those who turn and forsake covenant with him. This is how he feels. Verse 12, he bent his bow and set me as a target for his arrow. He drove into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. He now suffers as an enemy. God is pictured as someone who has taken out an arrow out of his quiver, strung it up, pulled it back, aimed purposefully at this individual, not in hopes of hitting them, but like Hawkeye last week, he doesn't miss, right? And God shoots it to his kidneys. In other words, the very inside depths of him and just is leveling him. And he's just getting nailed as an enemy would by God. Verse 14, I have become the laughingstock of all peoples, the objects of their taunts all day long. This isn't new. We know this. The thing about Lamentations is that each poem builds on the previous one. So we get themes that continue on, but we also get new themes that pop up which is very exciting. But we've already seen this. People are mocking them. Last week, they're clapping, ha, 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 hissing. You can imagine them wagging their finger, taunting. That does not feel good when people do that to you. Dwayne Garrett, commentator, he points out this, and I didn't realize this. I don't know how I feel about it, but I'll share it with you. He says that in this laughing and taunting is his very own people. So like Jeremiah, the prophet who came and was rejected by all, This person is even being laughed at by his own people. So if that's true, it seems that whatever faith he has, even to lament to God the pain and suffering he's feeling, other people are like, what are you doing? Just give it up. Stop. If that's the case, what a horrible place to be in. It's one thing to be laughed at by your enemy. It's another to be laughed at by your friend. Verse 15, it gets better. He has filled me with bitterness. 
He has sated. The word sated is another word for filled. He has filled me with wormwood. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. He suffers now as one who's been fed bitter and what feels like even poisonous food. His teeth have been given rocks to chew on and his teeth have shattered in the process of eating rocks. Verse 17, he says, my soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. The word for happiness is the Hebrew word tov, which means good. I forgot what good, what goodness is. So I say, my endurance has perished. I'm done. Can't do it anymore. And I think that if you were to put yourself in this situation, you'd be like, yes, can't judge that. I totally feel you. He says, so has my hope from the Lord. The poet has gotten to the ultimate horrific metaphor where he is now hopeless. And when you are hopeless, you have no belief that there is change. There's no getting out of this. And so what do you do? Quit, because there's no other way. Why keep going? He has lost hope because his soul has rejected peace. He's forgotten goodness. I like what Renkema says here. God has stamped out this old hope. And so oftentimes our hope can be misplaced. And so sometimes suffering and darkness bring our hope to a place where that hope needs to be stamped out or changed a bit, refocused, put in the right place. And so when that happens, it actually puts him in a good place for that to happen. He says in verse 19, remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. These metaphors, darkness, prisoner, enemy, laughingstock, pray. These metaphors are not something that was a passing bad night's sleep. It wasn't like I woke up at 12 and then at three and then at 4.30 and I couldn't go back to sleep and I just had a bad day, but I had a bagel and some coffee and like I'm good around lunchtime. Everything's good again. No, he is bowed down continually, stuck in these metaphors, suffering horrifically. And it's very easy to, to read it and not feel it. And I don't want to emotionally make you feel it, but this is heavy. This is very heavy stuff. And I want you to feel the heaviness a little bit because if you don't feel it, then the light doesn't shine as bright. If I were to turn all the lights off in this room and turn on one light, how, how bright would that one light be? But if I took out my phone and turned on the light right now, it, it wouldn't be very much to you at all because you can see all these other lights. Verse 21. In this state, this is what he says. In his state of hopelessness. He says, but I call this to mind and therefore I have hope. I want to give a full, fuller, what I believe to be a fuller translation of that. Ready? But this I return to in my heart. This truth I return to in my heart in the midst of all these horrible metaphors and I am caused to have hope. The, the Hebrew verb is a hifil, which is a causative verb. And if I'm getting that correct, I return to this truth in the midst of horrific metaphors and I am put in a place where now I am caused. I'm almost forced to have to have hope now because of this truth that still shines in the midst of these horrific metaphors. He says this, what is this truth that causes him to have hope? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. What is it that causes the poet to have hope for change, that things can get better in the midst of darkness, as a prisoner, as prey, as an enemy, as a laughingstock, as a dirt eater, as hopeless? What is it that does it? It's the character of Yahweh our God, particularly his love and his mercy. His love, God's love is beautifully multifaceted, like a diamond, a big diamond that shines from many different angles as the light hits it and it spins, so does God's love. You see, God's love, the Hebrew word chesed, it's very difficult to put this word into one English word or even a phrase or even one picture because it's so nuanced and it's so deep. Here are a few things. This love describes a love that is kind and thoughtful. To be kind is to think about others and how it will affect them. God's love here, it describes a love that is loyal and faithful, one you can trust. It describes a love that is unwavering and steady. In other words, it describes a love that you can count on. 
When I was a sophomore in high school, I had a girlfriend. And I walked out in second period. We were down at the bottom of my high school in a portable. And I look out, and my girlfriend had PE at the time, and I knew that. I was probably spying on her. I don't know what I was doing. And I see her with another guy. He was a senior. He was two years older. He was on the football team. And they're walking together, and then they sit together. And it's like, I don't think you're doing PE. I think you're hanging out with that guy. And I think he's hanging out with you. And then you know what? She was wearing his sweatshirt. (laughs) Come on, high school. Someone help me out. That's not okay. What are you doing wearing his sweatshirt, which is probably not PE certified? I don't care if it's cloudy outside. You should be running and sweating. What are we doing out here? That, that's painful. That hurts to see someone who you might like or even someone else who you might love do something like that. Like, where are we at? What's going on? When it comes to God and his love, you never have to worry about something like that. God's love is something you can count on. It's not that all of a sudden he's going to be over here talking behind your back, wearing someone else's sweatshirt or doing whatever it may be. (laughs) Mercy. Mercy refers to a deep-seated compassion. God has a deep and a passionate heart to relieve those who are suffering. That's mercy. I see your pain. I want to come alongside and I want to relieve you of that pain. I don't want to see that anymore. That's how God feels about suffering and pain. What pain in the world do you see? And it just, it grabs your heart and it makes you want to pick up the phone, donate money, call a cause, call your governor, whatever. What is it? For me, it's probably seeing kids hurting. Child trafficking. Okay, we're going to have to beat somebody up. Where where are we going? Someone's going to have to get beat, right? You just, you want to, it, it gets so deep into your heart, even your stomach and you feel it. Whatever you feel, God feels it much deeper. And God knows everything. So you can imagine the depth of the mercy coupled with the knowledge he has of all the evil going on in the world and the suffering and the hurting and all that God wants to deliver from that. <clears throat> Dwayne Garrett, he says that this term compassion, it signifies a warm compassion. He says a compassion that goes the second mile. A compassion that's ready to forgive sin, to replace judgment with grace. Is that not awesome? No wonder he is willing, no wonder his heart is caused to have hope because these characteristics are unbelievable and they're always true of God. And these blinding lights, these blinding truths of God, they never cease. I got to point it out. There's a, what I believe to be a chiastic or a chiastic structure here. If you look at your screen, the words in the Hebrew read like this. Love of God never ceases or literally is not finished. Never ceases, mercy. So we have, his character is bookended right here, love and mercy, and then it goes to a point in the structure of never ceases, never ceases. So what's the point? What's the ultimate point he's trying to get across about God's character? Never ceases. It's not finished. It's not complete. It's still going. It's still who he is. Therefore, my heart is caused to have hope. Is this poet getting away from the truth? Is he being a little wishful here? Come on, dude, look at your situation. God is a ferocious beast, a bear, a lion. Like you did something really bad and they did. Israel turned away from their covenant relationship with God. I would say, no, it's not wishful thinking. Scripture confirms this hope. We talked about it last week. Exodus 34 verses six and seven. God is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in what? Bounty and mercy, abounding in love. And that runs through the whole Testament like a thread. That theme is absolutely true. He is not wishful thinking. This is wisdom in turning to the revelation of God. God is the one who revealed this about him. Remember Jonah? He didn't like this about God because he didn't want other people to have it. But at least he knew it was true. The poet knows that it's true here. He says in verse 23, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God's character is new every morning. What does that mean? It doesn't mean it's brand new, like it's never been there. It's new in a fresh way. So as the earth spins on its axis, as the earth goes around the sun, every 24 hours, we get to see the sun afresh. It's still the same sun. You know it is. And we're still getting the same sun rays, but, but they're new. They're fresh. It, it, it's given us sunlight and sun rays in a way where we've never had it, but it's still the same sun and sun rays, is it not? God's love and his mercy is like that. Every day you get up, it's there and it's fresh, and we're able to turn to that, to rest in that. 
our hearts are able to find hope in whatever the metaphor it is that you are stuck in or that we might feel stuck in in the future. He says that great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness is like love. It's very hard to put into a word. Faithfulness describes consistency, loyalty, permanence, stability, something that is always there. I've used this before, but I'm going to use it again. When you wake up in the morning, before you throw your feet off the bed onto the ground, do you look to see if the ground is still there? No, you probably don't. You probably, with one eye half open, roll your legs over. If you have kids, you have no eyes open. And you put them right on the ground, and you're walking, you go about your day. Why? Because you know and you believe that the earth will be there. Great is the ground, the faithfulness of the ground to be there, because God has put it there. God is even more faithful than that. Where you can turn, and you can put your feet, you can put your heart, you can put your problems, you can put your life into the hands of Jesus Christ, because great is his faithfulness. He is loyal and faithful to what he said and what he will do, and nothing can change that. Therefore, our hearts are caused to have hope. He says in verse 24, the Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. And here we're reminded of our message. God's character moves us to hope for change and suffering. God's character moves us to a place where there is a possibility that it doesn't have to be this. All these metaphors he's stuck in do not have the final word. Who has the final word? God's character, his love, his mercy, his faithfulness as expressed and given through Jesus Christ, his son. Can I get a witness? Hoping in God is not the same thing as wishing. You may wish you win the lottery. You may wish your team wins a game later today. You may wish for a certain president of the United States. Hoping is different. Hoping is not wishing. Hoping biblically is, ex- is, is a confident expectation of something. And so when we hope in God, we are expecting God to act according to who he is and what he said he would do. And so this character of God gives us a confident expectation that he will still have love and deep compassion and faithfulness for his people and those who would turn to him by faith and believe in him. Hope doesn't really mean a whole lot until it's taken away from you. Kind of like a toy or maybe a, a card somebody gave you and then they're not around anymore and it's like, oh my goodness, that card might as well be worth a million dollars because there are no other cards like it. To lose that card would feel awful. Hope doesn't feel much until it's taken away. But no one can truly take away your hope in Christ. Here's the thing. You never actually lose that hope. Don't lose that hope because no one can take it away. Because as Chuck said this morning, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In his mediatorial work, bringing men to God, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nothing can change that work. And he sat at the right hand of the Father, signifying it is complete, it is finished. The Father has accepted that work. And now when you come through Jesus Christ, when you repent of your sins and believe upon him, it truly is finished for you. And we now persevere waiting for the day when he glorifies our bodies and takes us to be home with him. Amen. Amen. How would you do if your faith was dropped off the side of a high school football stadium? I don't really want to find out. I don't really want to know. But may God give you the hope that if you do find out, you could turn with broken, busted up heart and say, but I still hope in you because of your love and your mercy. Do you see how we had to work through darkness and the light hopefully shines even more brighter? You could say God is love and we know that. But when you see God is love in this kind of situation, in this kind of darkness and this kind of suffering with Israel, and we talked about it two weeks ago in chapter one, how horrible they were, idolatrous, adulterous. It is absolutely amazing. Don't lose your hope in Christ. Amen? So we know where hope is in suffering, but is there anything else you can do in suffering? And the answer is yes. The poet is now going to show us the good things we can actually do while you're still suffering and waiting to come out of it. Because let's face it, life, it doesn't always just, oh, I hope so I'm good. Everything's great again. No, it doesn't always work that way. Verse 25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him to the soul who seeks him. 
What is good to do in suffering? It's good to seek God. What does it mean to seek God? It means to call out to him, to tell him you need his help. Lord, I'm calling you because you alone have what I need. For some of us, this is really easy. It's really natural. You call God probably every other second of the day. Always on the phone with God. You're good at this. Other people, it may be hard because when suffering and darkness comes, your inclination is not to call God. It's to do what? Turn away. I don't want to call you because it hurts. And I'm mad at you because you're making it hurt. But remember all the way back to chapter one, we talked about it. The Lord is righteous and just in all of Israel's mess. And they even acknowledge that. One thing we always must remember, God is still true and just. He is still right and good in the midst of all the suffering for your sin or the disciplining for your sin or the sin you feel from the other, whatever it may be, God is still right and true and he is just. My kids love to play hide and seek with me. And one thing I've learned is they always, almost always hide in the exact same spot. (laughs) And not only do they hide in the same spot, they announce it. (laughs) Not only do they announce it, but they run really hard so I know where they're going. And then when they get there, they make noises so I know exactly where they're at. It doesn't take much long, much difficulty to find them and to seek them out. God is similar. He has made very clear where he is. He is on the throne of heaven and by his spirit, he is everywhere. And Acts, was it Acts 17? 20, forget. He's not far from each one of us. We're able to reach out and to seek and to call him. He's not far from you. And remember, David, even the darkness is light to you. God can see perfectly clear in darkness. I can't. Don't turn the lights off. I will run into something. God, I see it all. Verse 26, it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Another thing to do in suffering is to wait quietly for God's deliverance. I like what Dwayne Garrett says. He says this, to wait silently means to confess God's power in the situation. When you are waiting, you believe that God has the ability to deliver Now I'm sitting and I'm going to wait for you to act and to do your thing. That doesn't mean we stop being a Christian or we stop loving or bearing fruit or making disciples or going to work, but we're looking to God quietly to do what we trust him to do that no one else can do. If you have children around dinner time, they usually probably get hungry before you're ready to serve it. And before you can get it to them, they're probably letting you know how much they want it now and you're taking too long. And as parents, we have to remind them, it's coming. Have I ever not fed you? Am I going to forsake you at the table right now? No, we're going to bring it to you. So what do we tell them? Wait quietly. Relax. It's going to be okay. Stare at the ceiling. Do something else. (laughs) For us, it's similar. At the dinner table, we're waiting for the salvation of God in whatever area. Wait quietly, calmly, in control. We We don't need to have fits in in other words no god i trust you that doesn't mean you can't lament or share your pain but we don't want to have fits or bad attitudes verse 27 it is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him let him put his mouth in the dust that there may yet be hope let him give his cheek to the one who strikes and let him be filled with insults it is good to be humble in suffering and darkness When he gives his cheek to the one striking, when he says, let him be filled with insults. In other words, he's telling Israel, take the punishment, take the discipline, take what's happening and be humble about it. If you've ever had to go to the DMV to get something done, you will learn quickly that you're not special there. (laughs) They don't care that you need to get back to work. They don't. They don't care that you have kids at home you got to be humble while you wait in line. Same thing for us. We want to be humble. We want to take the long line, take the, take the whatever it is and trust in the timing of God. Remember, God's timing is perfect. We know that. Verse 31, for the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men to crush underfoot all the prisoners of the earth, to deny a man justice in the presence of the Most High, to subvert a man in his lawsuit, the Lord does not approve. We can also do this really good thing in suffering. We can remember God's heart. 
It's not to crush, it's to bless. God's heart is not, oh, I just can't wait for you to mess up because I have this new 3,000 XPS arrow that I'm waiting to just shoot at you so I can just take you down and show everybody how strong I am. We don't enjoy doing this with our kids, do we? I'm not looking forward to disciplining or taking things away. Timeouts. We don't want to do those things. We want to get along. We want things to be great. We want the siblings to love each other. Amen? Am I the only parent that, no, we want that. Our heart is to bless. We don't want to discipline. We don't want to crush. So in this situation, and in our situations, remember, it's not like God wants to, is excited to do this. He will, as he is a God we saw of anger and wrath and disciplines and punishes sin. We saw that last week. But that's not his heart. Listen to this. Gottwald. He said the expression, he does not afflict from the heart, is the high watermark in Lamentations. He says the angry side of his nature turned so unflinchingly against Jerusalem is not the determinative factor in the divine purposes. The anger of God was not the determinative factor. It was not his heart to do this. Begrudgingly, regretfully, if there's no other way towards his higher purposes, God may unleash the forces of evil, but his heart is not in it. That was profound for me in reading through Lamentations. I think most of us probably know that verse. Great is your faithfulness your love and your mercy than ever, right? If there's one thing you know about Lamentations, it's that verse. You probably go to Hobby Lobby and you see that on a, on a poster somewhere. <laughs> you probably bought it and you might go get it today. And I encourage you, yeah, get it, absolutely. But when you go through the darkness, when you go through Israel's suffering and then you read it, oh my goodness, does it not touch your heart? And I'm sitting there studying this past few weeks and it hit me in a whole fresh way that I, I don't know if I've ever experienced before. I was like, wow, God really is this. I know this, I can tell you, but when it hits you, and it sinks in a little bit, thank you, God. Because as you go through life, you never know the day where you need a fresh reminder of that truth. Verse 37, who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? Why should a living man complain, a man about the punishment of his sins? Last thing that's good to do before he moves on, it's good to remember the Lord's sovereignty in your situation. It's good to remember all of this is underneath God's sovereign, 100% control of everything hand. Nothing happens unless the Lord allows it. Both good and bad come from the Lord and are under his watch. Don't complain, Israel, about the judgment of your sins, but realize that they're under his sovereignty. I was thinking about Job. If Job went back and read his own story, he died, he went to heaven, and then God's like, here, read Job. We got the whole book published. You want to read it? Great. And he reads it. Do you think Job would have more understanding or less understanding? I don't know. It's a good question. You think, you think he'd feel better about it or he'd still kind of feel the same? I, I don't know if he'd feel any better. He'd be like, man, I just still kind of don't get it. I don't, I don't, like, I get it, but, like, I don't. And, and, and the point I'm trying to make is this. Even if we go back in our, in our situations, we don't always understand them. And even if we go back, we might have a little more hindsight, but, but we still don't fully get God's sovereignty and how all the pieces work together and why this person had to die here and why this person's still alive and why, why this is working out and why this is not. It's hard to make sense of all these things, is it not? And if we can't make sense of our own lives, how can we possibly make sense of everything? All of time, all of eternity, all of... It just... My brain falls apart. But I'm thankful that I don't have to know everything, and neither do you. We go back to what God has called us to believe, and ultimately that is in His Son, Jesus. There's a lot of good for you that you can do in suffering, that you can do while it's dark. You can seek God. You know where to find Him, through Christ on the throne. You can wait on Him, knowing He will take care of His children. You can be humble, You can remember his love, remember his mercy, remember his heart is not to crush, and remember his sovereignty. What will all of this do for you if you can remember this? It will help guide you and carry you through darkness so you will persevere and not quit, but remain in hope. After finding hope in suffering, after seeing what is good to do, the poet is now going to exhort towards prayer and confidence. And so we're going to read the rest together. Ready? Verse 40, let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. 
Absolutely, Israel. Let's return. We have been so bad. Let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. We have transgressed. We have rebelled. You have not forgiven. God has punished and dealt with them. You have wrapped yourself with anger and pursued us, killing without pity. You have wrapped yourself with a cloud so that no prayer can pass through. You have made us scum and garbage among the peoples. All our enemies open their mouths against us. Panic and pitfall have come upon us. Devastation and destruction. My eyes flow with rivers of tears. I can't stop crying because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. My eyes will flow without ceasing. My eyes will continue to cry without respite, that is without rest, until the Lord from heaven looks down and sees. My eyes cause me grief at the fate of the daughters of my city. Simply, Israel, turn to prayer and keep praying. Keep praying, keep praying. Your eyes, don't let them stop. Don't go to bed. Keep praying. Keep looking for God in the situation. Look to the Lord and his strength always. He says, he he turns a little bit. Now we're going to get a little bit of a personal testimony, which plays into the final point he's trying to make here. I have been hunted like a bird by those who were my enemies without cause. He's speaking about the Babylonians. What do you mean without cause? You guys were so bad. You deserved it. That's true, but it was without cause in a sense where them and the Babylonians didn't have beef. So there wasn't, that was without cause. He says, they flung me alive into the pit and cast stones on me. Water closed over my head. I said, I'm lost. This is it. I'm done. Like Jeremiah, like Joseph, he was cast into a pit, stones, water. He's about to die. But look at this. He says, I called on your name, O Lord, from the depths of the pit. Look when he called on the Lord, when there was like a second left. That's what it feels like. I'm lost. It's over. I call on the Lord from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ear to my cry for help. You came near when I called on you. You said, do not fear. You have taken up my cause, O Lord. Like a lawyer would take up someone and take him to the court and win for them. God took up his cause. You have redeemed my life. You have seen the wrong done to me, O Lord. Judge my cause. You have seen all their vengeance and their plots against me. He's really turning in this last point. Babylonians came after us. You delivered me from them. Now I want you to judge them. I want you to judge them. And he's even going to say, God, you will judge them. How does he know that? Because of the character of God. Remember, we're still lamenting. We're still in the lament. And part of that lament is the enemy has come and has hurt them. They're not happy about it because he was unjust. He says, you have heard their taunts, O Lord, all their plots against me. The lips and thoughts of my assailants are against me all the day long. Behold, they're sitting and they're rising. I am the object of their taunts. You will repay them, O Lord, according to the work of your hands. You will give them dullness of heart. Your curse will be on them. You will pursue them in anger and destroy them from under your heavens, O Lord. In addition to keep praying, he ends... Lamentations chapter three with trust. Trust God for the injustices that have happened. God acted in the past. How did God act in the past with this injustice? He delivered this person and he believes that God will act justly in the future. And so we remember that in suffering and darkness, if you have been treated unjustly, vengeance is not something we seek, but it's something you can lament to God and trust that he will take care of it at the end of the day. True and just are his judgments. We leave vengeance for him. God will take care of those who harm his people and turn away from him and won't reject his grace. And I hope that's none of you in here this morning. I hope not one of you would turn away from Jesus Christ and the love and the mercy he gives you by dying for you on the cross. And if we thought this metaphor was bad, this darkness, this prey, this is a glimpse of what Jesus Christ experienced on the cross. Jesus knew darkness. Jesus was like prey. Jesus was like a prisoner. Jesus was like the poison food and the teeth being shattered and and, and broken on rocks. Jesus was like one who was hopeless, but he wasn't hopeless because he knew his God and what he was carrying out for his people. Praise the Lord that he has gone through what he has gone through for us. Amen. Amen. Today we've been blessed to learn in this chapter that God's character moves us to hope. Are you stuck in suffering? Are you stuck in darkness? Look to the brightest lights in the world that never cease and that are great in abundance and they are faithful. God's love, his mercy, his heart, and as we saw the end here, his justice. You can find hope to continue on.
Don't you quit. Don't you give up on me. And let us encourage one another on until the Lord comes back. Amen? Amen. 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 We are going to continue our worship now by praising God's incredible name, singing Great is Thy Faithfulness. I want to hear your voices on this one. And we're going to take communion together. So if you are a born-again believer in Christ, you trust in him, you've repented of your sin, we invite you to the sacred table. And we ask that you would treat it with sacredness. If you're not a believer, don't come. But we hope one day you would by faith. But if you are, come. Grab the bread, grab the cup, symbolizing his body and his blood, and Pastor Chuck will lead us in giving glory to one of the greatest metaphors to Jesus Christ and the metaphor that he's given us of dying and paying for our sins so we could truly have light. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's give thanks and let's continue to worship. Gracious Father in heaven, we praise you so much that you are able to shine in darkness. Metaphors of darkness and suffering do not have the last say, but your, your character does, your beauty does. And Lord, all of us need that. And some of us need it really bad. And some of us need it right now. And, and I trust and pray that you would meet the hearts of the individuals in here. Oh, Holy Spirit, would you minister to the minds that are burdened, to the hearts that have holes in it, to the hearts that are cracked and feel bleeding on the inside that nobody could see. Lord, would you minister We believe your heart is to bless and not to crush. But Lord, even if you do crush, help us to be humble, trusting in your love under your sovereign hand, knowing that in due time, nothing will be compared to what you were bringing and what you're going to do in us. God, we worship you. Great is your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Fill your verses. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You think Paul read Lamentations? (laughs) I think so. And as Sean mentioned, this thread, to use his term, of God's character and his attributes and his nature and his relationship towards us as his kids It's a steady, constant theme that makes its way all the way through Scripture. And for anybody to say the Bible is not relevant today is is just not making sense because what we just read, every one of us endure suffering and injustice in a broken, fallen world. And yet, great is thy faithfulness. God's on the throne. Even the harsh things, the things we don't understand, he uses for his glory. All things work for good for those that are called by God. All things work for good because that's his character and that's his nature. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful for what we hold now, this symbol of your broken body, of your spilled blood. I love what Sean said, the idea that it it just breaks God's heart to, to inflict discipline and to inflict discipline upon his son that was, when you think about it, it wasn't discipline because... Jesus didn't do anything wrong. Instead, he took the wrongness. He took the the payment for sin, uh, the reality of death. He took all of these things upon himself. The, The cruelty of that death was done so that we would be set free. And we hold this bread and this juice this morning as a reminder that we were bought with a price. And much like this room, if it were completely dark, a light would make a big difference. And we want to remember that the light that has Uh, shown abroad in our hearts through the Holy Ghost is is you. It's your finished work on the cross, and it's the empty tomb, and it's the resurrection, and the impartation of new life to each of us. We celebrate that. We also remember that. We remember that when we're on the mountaintops, but as we're learning through Lamentations, we remember that when we're in the valleys, because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you're good towards us. You're good. You're faithful. You're loving you're merciful, you're kind, you're sovereign, you're just, and we celebrate you for that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake together. In closing this morning, excuse me, I think it's apropos that last week we had a baptism 
Baptism is a family affair where we welcome new kids into the children's ministry room. You know, well, whether you, however old you are, new kids are welcomed into God's kingdom. And we celebrate it as a family. Today, we celebrate a communion, a reminder that we were bought with a price. And we celebrate it as a, a church body, as a church family. We do it together. And I think it's apropos because, Roger, would you please come up now? Um, Roger Wathen is on his way to Illinois tomorrow. Uh, Roger and many of us have known each other for, I don't know, 20, 25 years. Um, you may know him because uh, being the contractor that he is, your, his fingerprints are probably over many of our homes over the past 20 or 25 years. Um, but, and Roger's given me the, the privilege to be candid about this. Um, uh, he's been struggling with, with cancer, as we, we very well know. The treatment is harsher than the cancer. So as of this week, he has, has basically foregone any more chemotherapy. And so he's going to go back to Illinois tomorrow to reconnect and, and rekindle relationships with family there. And to be candid, and he, he's told me his life expectancy on this earth is measured now in the months and not much more than that. So we trust God for a miracle, but we also want to uh, pray for him. But if I could, if I, could I, I was thinking, and I'm going to turn and face you, Roger, because I want to say this to you. And I was thinking over the, over the weekend, because this is pretty profound for me. Roger and Greta and I have just been just such good friends for such a long time. And he's always been the consistency, uh, a model of consistency, and a one who really wants to, to lean forward to, to know Jesus, to the, the upward call of the prize in Christ Jesus. And so I was thinking, I had an occasion to spend some time with him Friday, and I just thought as he was, he was in, our, in our company, it's like this dude is a living epistle. He's a living epistle, and by that, he is exhibiting what the New Testament teaches us about Jesus, about our faith. And so I was just Yesterday, after we got done texting, I was just looking around, a living epistle. Firstly, okay, I know it's in Second Corinthians, but tell me a little bit more about it, Google. And so <laughs> I wanted to know, and I found, this, I found this, this statement that this is Roger Wathen. This is what I will hold in my heart until we see each other in heaven. The bottom line is that a living epistle is someone in whom the Holy Spirit can do as he pleases. This is someone over whom Jesus Christ is Lord. We cannot determine what God is writing in us, and we cannot decide what kind of epistle God will write. No, all of that must be surrendered. A living epistle unto Christ is someone in whom God has written his Son, and someone in whom God is writing a message to his glory. So, Roger Wathen, I love you. We love you, and I salute you for being such a faithful friend and such a faithful servant to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, do you want to say a couple of words before we, we go? Or can you hold it together? <laughs> give, it, give it a try. Uh, you want to hold this. <laughs> Just the church has been amazing. Amazing. God showed his love through you. You know, we we know that God loves us and excuse me. We know that God loves us and um we can't even imagine that love, but when I got sick, scared to death, went to Chuck, um prayed, kind of lived it out, whatever, and the whole time, the last eight months, God has shown me nothing but grace, mercy, love, patience, kindness, goodness, stuff that I did not understand, and it's just, he helped me to just believe in him, trust in him, you know. Uh, so many times I think of what Mauricio did or this person or that person or that. And it's like, you know, they did do that, but that's through God that they did that. And he just knew all my needs. He has taken care of me. Um, I'm a little afraid of the future as far as health-wise, but I'm not afraid of the death. You know, the Lord has given me peace there. 
I know where I'm going. So when you guys have your um, the funeral for me, think of the the laughter that I'm having. <laughs> yeah, because it's, this is funny. This isn't biblical or anything, but I just put my dog down the other day, and uh, that was very difficult, but it was like after it was over, I was picturing him running around in my mansion of glory up in heaven <laughs> going, when's daddy coming home? When's daddy coming home? <laughs> so anyway, but I love you guys. I'm going to miss you guys. Uh, you know, if I'm healthy enough, I'll try to come back um, when it gets cold in Illinois. Uh, but I think my brother and sister are watching online. And if they are, we have we have big... Uh, Oh, they're all waving. (laughs) Um, We have big plans. We have a family reunion to have that we've never had before. And I'm just, the the Lord is just, you know, cancer. I'll quit here in a second. Now now he's got me warmed up, so. (laughs) Cancer has been one of the biggest blessings that I've had. I kid you not. It has just revealed who God is. To me, it's like, hey, it might be my last time, but it's the best time. So, thank you. Where, where's Mark and Audrey? Would you all come up? There you are. Okay, come on up and let's, let's pray. Well, let's pray for our brother. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord. Praise your name in darkness and in light, in heat and in cold, in comfort and displeasure, in justice and injustice. You are good, and we thank you for that. Um, I know all of us, uh, we look down the, the barrel of our mortality, and especially in Roger's instance, it's, it's visceral. And yet here he is praising God and revealing the the, the majesty and the faithfulness of your character. And so we just pray that you would bless him and keep him, make your face to shine upon him, give him peace. May these uh, times in Illinois, however long you should give him, may they be just a really neat time, not only to rekindle, but I know the last time he went, he wanted to go and and show Jesus off. And so may he continue to do that. Uh, Shepherd him, guard him under the shadow of your wings as our, our good shepherd. And we are just are so grateful that we have these promises that, just like Jack, we'll, we'll be up there and we'll be able to enjoy one another's company only forever, detached from the suffering and misery that we often face on this earth. And so, bless him, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I thought before we left, I, I asked uh, Stephen if uh, he would uh, allow us to serenade Roger with the song that we sang about 25 minutes ago. Stephen? The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face. To shine upon me and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give Love you, baby. All right. Thanks so much.